So welcome to Road to the White House uh, 2012, which is a series that's co-produced by three different parts of USC. We're kind of the, the goal of USC is to be interdisciplinary in many fields. This is one such field. So I'm Jeff Cowan with the Center for Communication, sit, Leadership, and Policy. We'll be putting on these events uh, every third week on Wednesdays. Uh, the um, Bedrosian Center at the School of uh, of uh, uh, Planning, Policy, and Development will be putting on every third week, uh, led by uh, Dan Mesmanian and Dan Schnur uh, in the Political Science Department in the college, uh, and the Unruh Center will be doing it every third week. So we will have these every week for those of you who want to come. There will always be food. There will always be good conversation. Uh, and we're kind of experimenting from our standpoint with this, this, this 11.30 to 12 period I don't know what to, how to think about it, because most of the people were here between 11.30 and 12, but we thought we shouldn't start the conversation until 12. We don't know if that's what it'll be like moving forward. Let me mention a couple of other events, because the room is filled with people who are political junkies, and you will be politically educated in an hour, if you aren't already. But tonight, of course, as you all know, is the Republican presidential debate. Unclear if Rick Perry is going to be part of that debate at this stage. Maybe it's known by now. Um, but that debate is, we're going to have a viewing for that debate in the Annenberg East Lobby. And uh, Dan Schnur and a fellow of our center, uh, Roberto Soro, a great uh, political correspondent for the New York Times and the Washington Post before coming to us, uh, who now also runs on, uh, on campus, the Tomas Rivera Institute, will be part of that conversation. Uh, then on tomorrow night, we'll have a viewing of President Obama's address on jobs and the economy to a joint session of Congress. I'm sure you all followed the drama about that, uh, which will be in, also in Tudor Hall in the Rosen Family Theater. Next week at the same time, with uh, food at, starting at 11.30 and conversation starting something like 12, Dan Mesmanian of the, Center for, of the uh, Pedrosian Center and Policy Plan Development uh, will be hosting conversation with Richard Green on the impact of the housing market on the elections. Um, and on September 28th, our Center for Communication, Leadership, and Policy will once again be in charge of this conversation. And our special guests will be Inarda Zacchino, uh, who was the uh, uh, editor of the Los Angeles Times and of the San Francisco Chronicle, who's writing a book on and will be leading a discussion of California versus Texas facts and fictions. We'll find out what we learn by then. Uh, the room is filled with a lot of fascinating people, including, for example, Richard Reeves, who has just been waving to Morley Winograd, former chief political correspondent for the New York Times, and many other terrific people here. But there's one group that I want to particularly identify before we get started, and that is we have 10 fellows of the World Press Institute who are with us. They are terrific journalists from around the world. They had their own conversation with Morley and Mike before this. Uh, this is their website that you can see up here. And they include correspondents from China, from, uh, from Brazil, from Egypt, um, uh, from Uganda. It's an amazing group. They're going to have to leave at 1. I hope we'll be finished by 1. If we're finished a couple minutes before 1, maybe you'll have a chance to meet with them. They are truly an inspired group. And when we have a conversation, a question and answer later, I hope that they'll be part of it. But now for the main attraction. Um, Morley Winograd and, and, uh, and, and Mike Hayes. Uh, Mike Hayes, as you've, and you, many of you have seen his, uh, uh, his vita, was a top political pollster. He has his own academic background, was for many years the vice president of Frank Maggot Associates, which is the leading entertainment um, research firm, and is, uh, has been partnered in writing two books with Morley Winograd. I'm going to say more about those books in just a moment. Uh, Morley Winograd, many of you know, I see that there are a lot of Winograd groupies out here <laughs> because he spent years at the Marshall School and uh, some of, can I have the Marshall Schoolians, the Winogradians put their hands up, some of the, there are several of them out there. Thank you all for, for coming here. Um, and I hope, by the way, you'll all stay and, and buy books at the end of this, of this session. But besides his years at, uh, at USC, uh, I first became aware of Morley when he was the chairman of the Democratic Party in Michigan. Uh, he actually ran a commission that had, of all things, the name uh -oh, of the... Uh-oh, we're going back into history. The Winograd now. Commission, it was <laughs> called, of all things. That's what happens when you have a commission with a long name and you have a shorter name yourself. Um, 
During the, the uh, Clinton administration, he was in charge of reinventing government in the White House, a kind of forgotten period when we actually wound up with a budget surplus, largely due to Morley's terrific work. Um, and he and Mike have, have uh, co-authored now a couple of books. The one we're going to be talking about today that I'll show in a moment uh, is a very exciting new book. But I want to read, for those of you who haven't had a chance to, just give you a sense of the kind of attention they got for their, for their last book, which was called Millennium Makeover, MySpace, YouTube, and the Future of American Politics. And they wrote this book before the 2008 election. And they predicted, and I'm sure they'll talk about this today, that this group that they call themselves millennials, and by the way, most people in this room fit into your generation, and so they have something very important to say here, uh, as this has something important to say to all of except you. Except for the Marshall groupies. Except for the Marshall groupies, who have just, just passed that group partly by a few days. But, but they predicted in this book that came out before the 2008 election that the, people, the group they call the millennials would have a huge impact on that election, and many people doubted it. The smart pundits all said, oh no, millennials will never vote. They predicted they would. Uh, the New York Times review of the book called it fascinating, although they weren't entirely persuaded by it, but a fascinating book, uh, the Times review said. And interestingly, the Weekly Standard, these two guys are both Democrats, the Weekly Standard, which of course is a, a Republican publication, in a very interesting uh, review by Fred Barnes, was very complimentary about the book and said they aren't unbiased observers, but they have a case. And they concluded by recommending that their readers should read this book if they really want to understand the political process. If you want to understand the political process going to this next year's election, I hope you will stay around and sign and, and stay for a signing of and a purchase of Millennial Momentum. If you can say it six times in a row, you've just done a tongue twister. Uh, we're going to have book signing up there afterward, and I do hope that people come and stay and purchase this book. But for now, we'll have to be satisfied with a terrific presentation by our great colleagues, Morley Lunergab and Mike Hayes. Morley, start Thank with you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I begin by asking those people who got stuck sitting on the floor that there are actually wonderfully comfortable seats over on this side? And nobody will mind if you walk across. Do, okay. do millennials prefer sitting on the floor? So it's a lot easier to see, and and they'll even let you eat over here. I don't know if there's any food left, but they'll let you eat if you sit over here. More food coming. Food is on the way. Food's on the way. Books are on the way. Let's have a conversation. Well, um, I, Mike and I are very uh, pleased to be here. This is the first time we've had a chance to talk about the book, and since we've been living it and writing it, for over a year, it's, a, it's really a day that we've been looking forward to for some time. And on a personal level, of course, I've been looking forward to coming back on USC campus. Uh, Jeff has been kind enough to give me a very exalted title as senior fellow at the center, his center for communication. And if you buy policy. the book, you'll own it inside of your book jacket. That's right. Um, and then he let me go off and write the book, so I haven't had a lot to work for on for the center. So it's nice to pay all that back. I also, obviously, we've acknowledged my friends from CTM who are here today. Uh, there's a special acknowledgement due because the title of this book, which is so difficult to say that we generally call it MM2 as opposed to the first book we wrote, uh, but the Millennial Momentum title was actually created in a conversation with Lucy Hood, who is now the head of the Institute for Communication Technology Management, CTM. As I like to say, uh, I used to be Lucy Hood, and she, uh, and she gave us the title for the book. So thank you, Lucy, publicly. Appreciate that very much. You know the gentleman sitting next to you, Mr. Don Lu, the power of San Pedro. So as long as you get along well with him, you can go down uh, that part of town and come back alive. So that's good. Um, so let's talk about, uh, let's talk about uh, one of the themes of this uh, book, which is all about the millennial generation's impact on America, and because of the nature of this series, we'll talk about it, their impact in the context of a political question. And we, uh, we've called the, the talk, or brief talk we're going to give, lots of time for question and answers. Uh, search for a civic ethos, and that's a fundamental theme of the book. So if we can have the next slide. This is what we mean by this civic ethos conversation and what we think the 2012 election will be about. 
Uh, for those of you who were here last week uh, for the UNRWA Center's uh, uh, contribution to this dialogue, you heard a lot about candidates and tactics and issues conversation, which is all true and, and, and all of that will go on and will be reported in depth. But behind that conversation will be this conversation that America is going to have. And uh, the President said we're going to have a vigorous debate about it for 16 months. And it's about two contrasting visions of what the future of America should hold, particularly in the first half of this century as we turn to a brand new challenge both globally and nationally in American democracy and, and its ability to, to, to stay competitive and, and maintain its le world leadership. And this is what we believe will be fundamentally uh, at stake in the 2012 election and what the election will really be about no matter what else you might hear in the course of it. It will not, however, be the first time that America has had this conversation. Um, we have had a debate, if you can, next slide, uh, about America's civic ethos, generally roughly every 80 years. A civic ethos is the question about what should the size and purpose of government be? And we have torn ourselves apart over this issue three times before in our history with as much rancor and vitriol and in some cases violence as you're about to witness and have already begun to witness in this campaign. And so we think we might benefit, uh, you all might benefit and we might benefit from an interchange about the historical and gen generational context of this civic ethos debate and what history might teach us and what generational theory might teach us about that. So let's first talk about, and I'll let Mike do it, uh, sort of the debates that we've had about this in the past. Uh, next slide, please. And you really have to talk to the mic the, or you won't hear you. The, this is, as Morley mentioned, the first of three previous debates we have had on uh, this matter of, of the new civic ethos. These new civic ethos debates occur when a generation like the millennial generation, which generational students, generational theorists call a civic generation, is emerging into its young adulthood. And they occur during these particular periods. At these times, Americans argue over the role of government, the role of the individual within government. Uh, the first of these debates was in the late 18th century when Americans argued for the first time over uh, what the rights of the individual were, what government should be doing, what its role in society and the economy were. We kind of think now that everybody in America was a patriot. Everybody wanted the uh, British to be kicked out. Everybody wanted the Constitution. Uh, we hear people talking today about the Constitution being uh, God-ordained and things of that nature. But actually, there was great division within that period of time. Maybe a third of the population in America at the time of the Revolution were Tories, a third were in favor of, of independence, and a third were on the fence. When it, uh, after the abortive uh, Articles of Confederation proved to be ineffective, uh, when the Constitution was created, there was huge rancor, huge division over a variety of different issues, and the public was evenly divided, many of the states. Uh, the major states that had to vote on those issues, New York, Pennsylvania, uh, the, the Constitution won by a vote or two in those state legislate, legislatures and, in fact, demanded the need for uh, a Bill of Rights to be put into the document, a political compromise, as well as our compromises over slavery, to be able to even pass that document in the first place. So that was the first of these debates. Eventually, it set up the framework of government that we really operate under until this very day. Next slide, please. The second uh, of these debates occurred in the middle of the 19th century around really the issue of slavery was the, was the uh, core issue. Uh, can non-white people be, have rights, be citizens, be, have equal rights of, uh, that, uh, that any other American could possibly have? But also there was an issue of government. There was a particular concern. What are the rules, what are the rights of states? The states have a right to set up their own system operating differently than other states. And eventually we, that debate was decided against slavery and, uh, and, and having the notion of federal supremacy 
uh, on a variety of different issues. And I just want to read you a quote. This is from a, a gentleman by the name of Shelby Foote, who is a historian. He spoke extensively in Ken Burns' great documentary about the Civil War. And, and I was watching this the other day and just found this fascinating. But it really did talk about how that particular debate over civil, the civil, civic ethos was decided. Uh, Foote said, before the war, the Civil War, it was said that the United States are. Grammatically, it was spoken that way and thought of as a collection of independent states. And after the war, it was always the United States is, as we say today, without being self-conscious at all. That sums up what the war accomplished. It made us an is. So the country came from a collection of independent states to one of a national, uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a complete nation. Next, please. The, the final of these debates before the one we are going through today was during the Great Depression era. And the argument there was very specifically what was the role of the government, the central government, in the economy? Uh, who should it benefit? Should it, should it provide a modicum of equality, of, of, of protection for all people? It was eventually decided that the role of government was indeed to, to to uh, guide and protect the economy and to provide a, a, a floor beneath which no American could fall in terms of his or her economic well-being. And that really sets the, the tone for the debate we are having today. Americans expect government to be able to work on the economy and, and keep the economy stable. And as we go to the next slide, there's one thing you may not have noticed in those slides, that is every one of those debates took over a decade mm -hmm. to resolve. And it was extraordinarily contentious at the beginning. The consensus was not easily found. And so for those of you who think, well, you know, how long is this going to go on? Well, could be the rest of the decade, could be longer. But we do believe that one of the crucial uh, e uh, events in the course of this event, uh, in the course of this debate, rather, will be the 2012 election. Now, each of these, uh, each of these events starts with a period of what we call fear, uncertainty, and doubt for the business school folks here. That's the old FUD sales tactic, but borrowed for this purpose. And what happens is that the country recognizes that the way things were isn't working anymore. This became very clear in our current situation with the Great Recession and the collapse of the financial systems in 2008 in the middle of an election. Uh, but if you think back about those other three historical periods, they each began with a big bang of a big event that undermined the assumptions, the working assumptions that people had about government at the time. And so the search begins for a new set of rules and assumptions that we can all acknowledge does work. And almost inevitably, the debate in a political context uh, evolves into two camps. One, the Tories of the revolutionary time period want things to be what they are or were and want them to stay the same uh, and are sort of saying the only thing wrong is that we didn't do what we used to do well enough, but we don't want to change how we behave as a country. And then there's always another camp that says, no, no, no. The past is no longer relevant or applicable, even if it was right or wrong then. It's not good for today. And we need to go into this new future, which I will describe to you but can't promise you will work out. And that's not always a very appealing political argument, that I want you to take a leap of faith with me into a new future. And so those kinds of those, that two camp kind of look backwards, look forwards argument devolves into this next slide, which we've tried to suggest, um, is a contest between generations in power and generations seeking to take power. And it is that particular distinction that allows us and causes us to focus on the generational ch changes and differences that exist today in America. Because it is that generational context that is what you're going to uh, sort of witness. And so you, 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 have, you have to be careful about the generational thing when you think about the debates in Congress, because most of those folks in Congress are baby boomers whose preference for their entire life is to argue and not settle anything. Um, that's been the cultural wars of the country for 40 years. 
They're, they strongly believe in their values. They're not interested in compromising values. You're not interested in compromising your values. That would be morally wrong. It's a very difficult political attitude to take, but one boomers hold too strongly. And then you also see the first wave of sort of a, a next generation, Generation X, that, that succeeded boomers and preceded millennials, who have a very hostile attitude towards almost all institutions. And that's why they make such great entrepreneurs, but at the same time, in a political context, it, they become sort of the Eric Cantors, who's a Generation X Republican leader, uh, 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 not in favor of continuing to support the institutions of government. That's not the generational battle we're talking about with these lions. We're talking about you, the millennial generation, still in your 20s, about to be in your 30s, not yet represented in the halls of Congress by anyone yet but soon to be, and soon to be the leaders of the country. It is your attitudes and your beliefs that will come into the starkest conflict with the people who hold power and will ultimately, in our belief, determine the outcome of this debate. So the debate is somewhat complicated, by next slide, by this other trait in American democracy. And this other trait is that as we tr search for a new civic ethos, people on either side tend to focus on one thing or another. They think that you know, one way of doing it is, is absolutely right. But in fact, America is a, a country that's, whose political and public opinion tends to be very divided uh, between, because Americans and America are both liberal and conservative at the same time. On one level, they are what is referred to as, oper uh, as ideological conservatives. That is, they tend to believe uh, our ideology, our guiding force is we want limited government, small government, individual responsibility, state rather than national power, things of that nature. So we believe that at an abstract ideological level, but at the same time, we also believe strongly in specific governmental programs to handle and solve and help us with specific per particular concerns. And so you see the picture on the right of the place in a flood, that's actually my old hometown of Cedar Rapids underwater. Uh, when Cedar Rapids went underwater, or as today, when Texas is burning, you find governors saying, well, we need the federal government to do things for us. We have these specific <coughs> needs, these specific concerns, where at the same time, you also will have them say, but we also believe that Americans have a responsibility as individuals, as, as, uh, as and, and local government should be supreme or, or dominant. Now, we won't have time to get into depth with this particular part of the uh, uh, challenge of American democracy, but there is survey research data that takes this dueling attitudes, ideologically conservative, I want individual responsibility, I want too much government, and an equal, an equal, not separate, not one individual thing in one way, one individual the other, the very same individual saying, but I also want government to provide the programs I need to make sure that I can be successful. You can trace that in survey research back into the 1930s when survey research first started. It is a constant of American politics. Th that just is an aside, just why it is not necessarily inconsistent where for some people, some Tea Partiers might say, well, we don't really like socialized medicine, but we want our Medicare. And they wouldn't necessarily see a, con a, a conflict in that kind of belief uh, that some other folks might. And this is not only a constant in modern political survey research, but it's been a constant in American democracy. The genius, in fact, of American democracy is its ability to figure out how to blend together what President Obama tends to call the two strands of Americans' political DNA. That is, a strong belief in individual responsibility and an equally strong belief in collective action. So if you go back to the, to the pioneers, in fact, you get all the stories about rugged individualism, but you also get the stories of everybody getting together and helping their neighbor build a barn. And that is essentially what Americans, America has been about uh, from its inception. And the trouble is, how you put those two things together is not easy, and it doesn't stay together as the conditions and the environment, both the economic and globally, change. And that's why we're in the middle of the debate we're having today. What we argue for, in the book is that the answer to this particular debate will come from the millennial generation and from the millennial generation's beliefs. That, quote, civic generation, as Mike talked about before, will be the one that finds a way to combine these two enduring traits of American democracy and political thought 
into a new civic ethos. We're going to spend just two minutes, maybe three, on millennials, and then we're going to open it up for your questions because we have, we will show you at the end without leaving you hanging, what that civic ethos might look and, like and I, I would, if millennials got a chance to write it. And I will just mention one other thing. These civic generations have made the difference in the past. It was the a, a generation called the Republican generation at the time of the Revolutionary War that, that won the revolution that created many of the institutions. Members of that generation to... include Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and Alexander Hamilton. One of you may be one of those people coming forward. And, and more recently, at the time of World War II and the Great Depression, it was the GI generation, what Tom Brokaw called the greatest generation, that, that, that created that new civic ethos that we are still more or less operating in, in, under, or at least we're at the very ends of of that particular, uh, uh, that particular uh, arrangement. So next slide, a couple of slides on millennials. Okay, you all recognize yourself here. These are the seven traits of millennials, classic uh, <clears throat> results of their upbringing. They're special, just ask their baby on board minivan driving parents. Um, they've been very protected. 9-11 happened in the middle of this generation's upbringing. And, uh, and, and increased uh, even greater the uh, need to shelter and protect everybody. They've been raised uh, the way Bill Cosby taught uh, everybody to be raised, uh, which is build up the child's self-esteem, don't physically discipline them, but have rules that have consequences, and tell them every time they do something they did a nice job. So for all of you who remember being told you did a nice job, and for all your grandparents who've been instructed by your children never to say anything but nice job to your grandchildren, uh, that's a self-esteem builder, and guess what? It builds self-esteem. And so we have a very confident, achieving generation. If they weren't confident before, after they elected President Obama, they absolutely believe they could do anything. And, uh, and uh, one other thing about this generation that distinguishes them from others, well, there's two things. One is their tolerance. We like to put up uh, Barney, the purple dinosaur, to trace the uh, generation's root belief in the fact that even though Barney's a purple dinosaur on the outside, he's as different for me as he could be, but on the inside, he's just like you and me. So we have a tolerant generation that thinks everybody is of equal value, and that greatly, greatly impacts their political attitudes on all the social issues. And then we also have a generation that grew up with rules and agrees that there ought to be rules. They argue, negotiate the rules, they don't argue about the fact that there are rules, which is what Richard Reeves' generation and Jeff Cowan's generation did. We've got to reject those rules and start over. And we don't why have any rules. In fact, the slogan of Gen X is no rules. Uh, but that's not where the millennials are at. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And just to underline that pictorially, generations do change. These two magazine covers are only a decade apart. One illustrates the Generation X, who would be 30s, 40s, but not late 40s in America today, alienated, unsmiling, dressed in black. The future is doom. Uh, it's only us as individuals who can save me as an individual. Ferris Bueller's day off, if you will. Uh, John Lennon said he doesn't believe in the Beatles, he only believes in me. That's a Generation X philosophy. Whereas those hugging, loving, smiling, underwear hanging out, bright colored, clothing, dressed millennials don't, aren't anything like that. Age is, it's not an issue of age. We're not talking about a young folks versus old folks thing. We're talking about fundamentally different generational beliefs coming into conflict with older generations' now, beliefs. One of the things which, in addition to all these beliefs, all these traits that are, that are very millennial, very civic generation, as it were, that gives us confidence that millennials are going to make a big difference are two things. One is, first of all, their sheer size. They are the largest generation in American history. There are 95 million millennials currently alive uh, in America today. Uh, 
far many more than are members of, uh, of Generation X or even baby boomers. Uh, by 2020, one third of all voters will be millennials, so they will have the numbers to make a difference. Secondly, they are a, a very diverse generation, the most diverse in American history. 40% are non-white, 20% are the children of immigrants, uh, so they are very, they, they look differently than Americans have in the past, and they are united in many ways. And just now, so we can open up for questions, here's the answer. Okay, if the millennials have the numbers that Mike just said they do, and they do, if they have the unity of belief, they do, they're a very consensus-oriented generation. Almost all of them think the same, believe the same things, about two to one ratio when it came to voting for Obama and on almost everything else. If that's all true, what's that gonna look like? So here's only one slide about what that might look like. That's the right one. Um, there's a couple of unique traits about the generation that we think hold the key to America's new civic ethos. One is that this generation is both pragmatic and idealistic at the same time. The baby boomers are very idealistic, ideologically driven, believe values and ideals are really important, and are uh, sure that they have the right ones, even though half of them believe one way and half the other. They're inside that group. They're very confident they have the answer. Uh, generation X is pragmatic to a fault. Tell me the bottom line. I'll get you the results you want. Leave me alone. I'll figure it out. But let's get something done. Let's not talk about it. I'm tired of all this talk. Millennials, for some reason, do both. They are interested in getting stuff done. One of the favorite lines you'll hear out of Obama's speechwriter, who is a millennial. And they, at the same time, are motivated by causes. That's what gets millennials going, to change, something that will change the world. So that's one aspect. And the other way is the, that's unique is the way they think you ought to go about changing the world. It's a very bottom-up, driven kind of approach. We will, as individuals, engage in collective action, but we'll do it at the local level. And by doing so, we will change the world or we'll change the country, depending on what the issue is. And you can see that in the Arab Spring if you want to look elsewhere in the world to see some of this kind of local action creating major turmoil and change. In the entertainment industry, you can look for it uh, as recently as Napster which destroyed the overhead of the, of the music industry overnight. So, so that kind of locally driven pragmatism and idealism <coughs> will bring collaboration and individual empowerment into a new civic ethos synthesis that will appeal to both conservatives and liberals and resolve this country's debate. You'll just have to wait a while for all that to sort out. Okay. Molly, before you open this up, and, and I do want to open up for discussion, not just question and answer, because after all, we have your, that generation so heavily represented yes. here. And, and by the way, the, the forums that we run as part of this uh, Center for Communication and Leadership Forum, we hope will be more like salons than like just Q&A. So we encourage you, um, whatever your age, to be a part of this discussion in a moment. Morley and, and Mike, I want to ask you a couple of questions first, though. You wrote about the overwhelming support of this particular subgroup in the 2008 election. Something like the, the Obama margin was seven or eight million or something like that, is that right? Or? It was, uh, millennials uh, accounted for, uh, it was about seven million votes, but millennials accounted for 80% of Obama's popular vote margin over John McCain. Uh, Obama might have won the election without the vote, votes of millennials, but it would have been a very but narrowly But the spread divided. was something like seven was, million. Yeah, you know, and it was two to one ratio of vote. And in terms of just the numbers, and I'm just asking this because there's so many political junkies here who want to know this kind of thing. So obviously the number of millennials who will be voting this, who are, who are eligible to vote will have increased. Um, how, how would you think of that if the same turnout and the same facts pertain for this next election? Well, the same facts pertain for this election. First of all, millennials who, who comprised 18% of the electorate in 2008 will, if, if they vote in as large in numbers, will comprise or vote in numbers that they, should, that they are large enough to contribute, will, will uh, contribute about 24% this, this particular election. Um, if they vote in the margins that they did, over two to one for Obama, then, then Obama's re-election chances are almost reassured. I don't know whether that... And I want it, there it, it moves up into the nine million range of margin. Right. Vote if it were the same thing. Yeah. But I, I want to ask you one other question before we, before we open this up. 
Um, your insight, which was debated by people like even Jim Carville on the same side of the political yes. equation, uh, and plenty of people on the right, uh, said, well, you know what? Maybe their preference is for Obama. I'm going back to that point. But they don't vote. Your Carville's words were, show me a candidate who's counting on the youth vote, and I'll show you a loser. And what you predicted was that they would vote, and in fact, they voted in the same proportion as the rest of the electorate. But my question now is looking to this next round, because your big insight was that they would vote. Snapshot today from what you know, are they still voters in, in those well, numbers? that is probably the operative question for, for the Obama campaign and for the Democrats this year, one of their, their major questions. What happened in using 2010, the off-year elections, the midterms, as, as, as an example of what could happen, however, millennials voted at about the same rate that they had voted in 2006. So their, their turnout was about at that level. For what a non-presidential year. For a non-presidential year. But what happened was older people, particularly senior citizens, voted in extraordinarily large numbers. They voted overwhelmingly for Republican candidates, and that's why the, uh, there's a Republican House of Representatives today. So I think there are two questions that have to be answered for, for Obama and the Democrats. One is, will the turnout be as large absolutely and relatively as it was in 2008? And the second question is, will they vote in the same margins that they did for Obama? So far, it appears the, the millennials still identify as Democrats by about a two to one margin. They are still, a majority of millennials still approve of the job that the president is doing, the only generation that is, that is in fact still doing that. So I think the, the uh, preference numbers may hold up for, for the Democrats. The biggest question really is, is whether millennials will vote in as large a numbers. Our prediction is that as a civic generation, civic generations tend to be involved. That's one of the reasons they are called civic generations by generational theorists. But really, I think that is the huge issue that, that, that needs to be decided. How will, will millennials vote in absolutely large enough numbers and how, they, how that will stack up at, at relative to other generations? Now, you can assume that the margin won't be as large and the enthusiasm won't be as great. But as you pointed out in your opening question, there's so many more of them. They now represent one out of every four eligible voters in America. By the end of the decade, there'll be more than one out of every three. But that puts their, their numbers greater than senior citizens, for instance. And so you can, you can if you're trying to be the Obama strategist, uh, settle for a little less margin and a little less turn out and still come out pretty good, but you can't let the constituency go away. You can't leave it unmotivated and unvoting or you'll have a 2010 outcome. So let's open this up for, for general conversation. And once again, particularly urge the millennials in the room to get on the conversation and say how this resonates with you and with your, your contemporaries. Yeah, and, and, and when you speak, please identify yourself if you could, please. Uh, my name is Bob Stone. And you are not a millennial. <laughs> you're, you're being so ageist. But I, wish, no. <laughs> I, I wish I were. That's right. Spirit, right? That's Bob right. Spirit. He's the grandfather of a number of millennials. Uh, my question is, you've taken the millennial vote of, of 2008 and extrapolated it, and a 7 million uh, edge for Obama would become a 9 million under, uh, under, under the circumstances. How about the old folks who came out and voted for McCain in 2008? Is, is their number going to decrease? And what, what would that do to the electorate? Well, let, let me make a crass comment first, since we're of the same generation. First of all, we're all dying, so there's less of us. Um, That's uh, a good sign. Yeah, well, <laughs> actually, we quote in the book Grover Norquist, who once wrote about the GI generation, and in his opinion, they were an aberration, although that's not true. But he thought their status beliefs, as he called them, were an aberration. And he concluded his little piece on them by saying the good news is every day more of them are dying. So uh, we don't want to quite go where Grover went. Uh, uh, but uh, there are disproportionately less of older generations uh, by definition, right? I mean, that's just the way the population breaks out. Of course, you know, as the very oldest die, 
others fill their places. The, the 60 year olds of 2008 will be 64 years old of, in, 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 in 2012. Uh, but I, again, I think it is a matter of, of, of relative turnouts and relative uh, support. Uh, the older generation, the silent generation, did vote for John McCain by uh, about six or seven, eight percentage points in 2008. Uh, in 2010, they were much more overwhelmingly positive uh, for Republican congressional candidates. So it, I think it is a balancing act that both parties are going to have to have to have to figure out. Um, if I were advising the president and his team, I would certainly, you know, try to maximize millennial turnout and 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 millennial support because I think that is where he is most likely to 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 to, to be able to uh, save his office. Uh, please, in back. Uh, yes, uh, Brian Blackwell, uh, School of Philosophy from the you know, Education Department. I'm very flattered by the portrait which you paint of my generation. Good. <laughs> I, I think uh, a lot of it certainly resonates. Um, I would like to hear what you think, though, about uh, the prospects for this sort of civic ethos being effective in actually achieving a lot of the goals which our generation holds. Because the worry which I have is that this this idea that, well, uh, uh, sort of um, very engaged individual action at the, the local level um, is not going to uh, solve all the really huge problems which we face. I mean, it seems like things like the working healthcare system or, or reforming the financial system, reducing the power of banks, uh, that requires a top down. It seems like it requires a top down. Yeah. So, so that, that's a very uh, good question because we wrestle with this a bit as we try and describe the new civic ethos in the book. They're just like their parents set rules for how the household was going to work. And even though you could negotiate as to whether it was a three minute timeout or a five minute timeout for violating the rules, you didn't argue about the rules. M millennials are interested in government and this drives conservatives crazy. Uh, setting some goals and guidelines for national behavior. So the individual mandate, for instance, in the health care bill sounds like a logical thing to most millennials. Yes, we all ought to have health insurance. Everybody ought to take on that responsibility. What millennials would object to in a top-down approach is then saying how you go about uh, abiding by that rule or behaving appropriately. So it would be useful to set you know, national standards around what educational reform should look like, which is what the Obama Race to the Top initiative does, but it leaves it up to all the schools and all the teachers on how to exactly implement those recommendations. That's a millennial civic ethos kind of public policy. And we haven't seen very many of them yet. The ones we have seen have been very successful, but of course, millennials and their numbers, that only 40% of the millennials are in the voting age population right now. It'll be the end of the decade before they're all voting, yeah. eligible to vote. 60%, 60 now. 60% in 2012. Will yeah, be will be eligible and, and all of them by the end of the decade. So that takes time, plus you have the institutional inertia of everybody in older generations who think a completely different way. Well, we better get a super committee together because none of us are gonna vote for anything unless we hold a gun to our head. No millennial would come up with that solution. We'd all get on the social network and we'd vote and we'd decide what it is we should do and then we all go do it. That's a different kind of bottom-up approach that's, that's, that's so radically different it's even hard to envision and describe. But, but so was democracy when the, when the Republican generation was advocating the American Revolution. What the hell is that? That's never going to work, right? And so, and so you, you will get there. It's just going to be painful in the process. And I, I would just add, well, uh, one thing to reemphasize the point Morley just made. At the time these previous changes occurred, there were people who had certainly had doubts. I mean, it just, it, it, democracy, how is this going to work? People don't have individual, shouldn't have individual rights. The whole Hobbes versus Locke kind of dispute as to what kind of rights. For our philosophy. For our student. philosophy friend, as, as what kind of rights human beings, individual human beings should have. It ended up working out, but not all, and, and we had the same kind of doubts. We had the same kind of charges about socialism, things of that sort back in the 1930s when Franklin Roosevelt was instituting some of his programs. 
Some of these eras, some of these changes have worked a little bit better than others. I would think most historians would argue that ultimately the end of the Revolutionary War period, the Constitution period, worked out pretty well, that the New Deal era and World War II era worked out pretty well. On the other hand, the Civil War period, while it certainly ended uh, with the freeing of the slaves, it, 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 people got a little tired of all the, all the conflict and eventually sl the, the former slaves were left in a position of being, uh, of, of really not having their rights be totally uh, and completely accepted. So some of these periods work out better than others. Morley and I are optimists. We believe this generation is going to make it work, but history will tell us how well it makes it work in the next uh, 20 or 30 years. As we go on and continue the discussion, once again, if you have a point you want to make, it's fine. This is a discussion, not only a Q&A and back. I'm interested in, I guess I'm a millennial, so I'm interested in thinking about where I grew up in Tucson, Arizona, um, growing, and what it means that the millennials are a generation that's grown up in an era of completely stagnating wages and rising debt loads, mm -hmm. um, as well as in an era where, you know, most of us, if not all of us, all know someone who was killed in the wars of the past 10 years and people who are locked in prison and what some of those contexts present for the civic ethos of the millennial generation. Every civic generation grows up in difficult economic times, the most classic being the GI generation that had to get through the Great Depression. They almost inevitably grow up in the middle of war, Revolutionary War, Civil War, World War II. It is the nature of that generation to take those events and leverage them into achievement as opposed to despair. It is either because you were all told how great you were growing up and you believe it, or what, but if you look at history, the generation gets dealt a rotten hand when they're young, and when they're in middle age, older, that experience causes them to be wonderful builders of institutions and, and achievement oriented. And if I could tell you why or how that happens, I'd bottle it and sell it. But it just seems to be historically true. And I will just add, this is not the first time that we've had these periods of, for example, gross economic inequality. And in fact, they have occurred in the past just as the, millennial, as the millennials of their era, the civic generations, were coming of age. The greatest e e period of economic e inequality, in fact, was during the 19, late 1920s. Uh, there were eventually government policies that redressed a lot of that. Um, whether that will happen this time or not uh, remains to be seen, but it, I think it is something that millennials will at least fight to try to, uh, to eradicate and to try to provide a more level service for everybody to operate under. Yeah, yeah, we can have the, the next uh, participant I have is over here. I'm not even going to say questioner because I really want this to be participation. But I have a question because it's the first time we've used this room. Are you able to hear it as people ask questions or make points in the audience? Is that working throughout the room? Good. Thank you. Hi, Amy Parrish, Anthropology and Ethics Studies. I'm interested in what you think this youth generation can take advantage of Web 2.0 kind of technology to really make a difference, or at some point will they still have to I'm thinking about Arab Spring, and sure, they all use cell phones, but they also came out to Korea Square. And do you see that coming in this 10-year time frame? Well, uh, Morley is really the technological expert here, so I will let him handle this mainly. But I, w I would say that, um, that it, is, it is really uh, more a matter of what the, of, of what the generation believes than, than specifically the, the technology that is going to be determinative of this. Uh, uh, and, 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 but, and our argument would be, however, that this generation is, in fact, equipped to fully use that technology, just as previous civic generations have, have been able to uh, grapple and use the technology of those eras. 
uh, uh, radio, it, it seems very archaic now, but in the 1930s it was, it was pretty revolutionary. National radio networks or uh, uh, the use of telegraph even back in the 1860s and so on. So uh, yes, I believe that, that this generation will be able to utilize those, uh, those, uh, those uh, things. Um, I, I, I will let Morley answer the question about the Arab Spring because we have actually written about that and how, how generations uh, overseas in the, in the Middle East use that. So there's an um, uh, interesting coincidence of behavior between the Obama presidential campaign of 2008 and its use of social media and the organizing techniques uh, used in the Arab Spring. And we write about this in a little uh, Kindle single, which is an ebook called Headwaters of the Arab Spring. If in addition to buying their well, book, yeah, you want to buy one of those. It's really cheap. It's only two ninety nine. Anyway, the the point here is that in both cases, social media were used to organize, to do the individual action at the local level. Let's all get together to change the world kind of activity. And in both cases, the key to its success was translating that online interest into offline action. We don't have an English word yet for moving on from online to offline. Your center ought to work on this word because offline doesn't sound particularly mm -hmm. good. But it's really the key is you get, you organize virtually using the power of social media technology but your actions that end up making a difference are either getting out the vote, knocking on doors, you know, going to, to hear square, whatever it might be, it end, ends up having to be physical action to change things. One question, one thing we don't know yet about specifically the instance in the, in, in the Middle East and in, in Egypt specifically or in, or in Tunisia, we do know that it was young people who were leading those revolutions were going to the streets uh, but we, what we don't know is whether those young people were members of a civic generation like the millennials or some other type of generation. There does seem to be some sense that they were perhaps a bit more of a reactive type generation. Uh, Gen X. Like Gen X in the United States rather than the millennials. So we really don't know that. Uh, I will say, however, that, that millennials, at least at this point, are much more willing to use the inst within this country, willing to use the institutions as they exist to try to reform those institutions. That's what civic generations do, rather than take to the streets as their baby boomer parents and grandparents did uh, uh, 40 or 50 years ago. In a moment, I'm going to call on one of our colleagues who's a millennial from Egypt, a correspondent, from, uh, from Egypt and who's on CNN and many other, many Egyptian publications and who was right there and she'll talk in one second. But first, a couple of little pieces of business. I know a lot of you are extremely excited to see that this book is being put over there. And those of you who are waiting desperately to, to get a signed copy, we will at the end of the session about 10 minutes, these guys will be up there signing them and selling them. Secondly, for those of you who wanted to buy those Kindle singles, we have a a link to it on our website of the Center for Communication wow. Leadership and Policy. So we're wow. selling the, the Kindle single that way. Uh, for those of you who have short books that you're dying to find a way to publish, Morley can a and Mike can afterward tell you how to do that through Kindle singles. But please, let's have the testimony from Egypt. Uh, we're Ten Fellows. We're here at World Health Institute from ten different countries. Um, it's been really fascinating to hear about the millennials. And as I'm 24, um, to talk about my generation. So I'm Egyptian. I've been in Egypt all my life. I've never lived abroad. It's very fascinating to see. There's a lot of parallels. There's a lot of similarities in the way we've been raised. But there's also a lot of differences when you talk about a reactionary versus, you know, to be proactive. It's a very different generation, different reasons behind the Arab Spring. You actively talked about social media, and I think this is a very important topic, and we've been discussing this for months and months, you know. Has it been the Arab Spring? What was social media and how we used it? You know, we had no internet for a whole week. We were cut off from the world. There was no communication. There was no phone, no box. And I think that's when we realized that we didn't actually you know anyone's landline number. We all have landlines, but no one ever actually used them. It's very easy to call it you know, Revolution 2.0. It's a very sexy, kind of easy way to 
explain it to an audience which might not get the context, the news is in the background, how far away this is actually going back. You know, since the labor strikes a couple of years ago, even before that, we had a big Facebook protest in 2008. So it was used. We did have a lot of organization. There was a lot of awareness that was created through these platforms. But you also have to remember that at least 85% of Egyptians got their information from television. The people on, we only have a 40% penetration rate, internet penetration rate. The people who do use Twitter and Facebook, they are a lot. But even with Facebook, even though I think we're in the top 10, 15 countries, that's still only 5 million. And we're 85 million people. Twitter, you have less than 200,000 Egyptians who use Twitter. We're 85 million people. So the people who get their information from social media are very, compared to the number of Egyptians, are very small. Even if you say the number of people in Tahrir Square, even if they really were a million, there's still 85 million people out there. So the role of social media, you can't deny it, is extremely important. But I would say that the most important role it played is that it created this platform of individuals who kind of thought the same, a kind of support. You know, I knew that if I was arrested, I could tweet immediately, and then I'd have a lot of people who would know what was happening. It wasn't so much the actual being online, because it was when we took to the streets, when the transaction were in the streets that changed. One last thing about my generation, which I think is just important to mention. I think the biggest difference between maybe my area of the world and here is like we were talking today, how very much we're still a very community-based culture, you know, very individualistic kind of, you know, what we can accomplish, that we are the best, that you are special, that you can do anything, is still very much limited by, but what is best for your family, what is best for your communities, what is best for your country, and that affects a lot of what you do. Even our politicians, we're still very much raised to think that they are your, like your grandparents, you know? And a lot of the, the support towards the water, even after, came from how, you know, people saw us, how degrading he was, and oh my god, how could you do this to him? So there's a lot of changes, not so much on the, and when it comes also to the internet, sorry, one last thing. Um, it's very easy to stay you know, on the internet, everyone thought it's going to create this huge world press where you can get all this information. But actually, it just helps if you want to stay limited to your own point of view and what you think, you can find, follow the people that really think the same way. Read the news from the organizations that you want. It doesn't have to create this kind of uh, diversity, like because the world is so, so flat, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that does increase your kind of uh, ability to accept and understand the other. You can remain just as close-minded, even more so, even with all this access you have, because you will only choose to follow and to read and to watch and consume the media that, that is what exactly what you think. And you have a lot of people like this in Egypt, in your region, and in the region. And actually around the world. Uh, in, in, in the States, of course, uh, Republicans and conservatives tend to watch Fox, liberals and Democrats tend to watch CNN or MSNBC. So people do tend to choose what, what they take prefer. One last question in back here. We have a few rules we try to impose here. One is that we want to be finished always by 1 o'clock to be respectful of students who have to leave and get to classes. Also to be respectful of authors who are anxious to sign their books for all of the desperate uh, uh, book buyers out there. But I do want to take one last question from the back. Hi, I'm Anne Howe. Um, I'm going to a conference next weekend that I think epitomizes this generation and the, the new civic ethos. It's called the Millennium Campus Conference. Uh, and it started about three or four years ago by students. And it's a student-led, student-run initiative to address the Millennium Development Goals that the UN created to, to accomplish by 2015. But students see these goals, which focus on international development, um, as not being uh, sufficiently accomplished. So they organize themselves into a network and then set up conferences at universities around the East Coast, uh, Columbia and Harvard. And uh, I went last year, and I feel that the, the energy of my generation fits exactly the description of the civic ethos that, that you have described. Uh, at the same time, I think that a lot of the students are searching for what they can practically do after they graduate, which is um, why there is a panel called on post-graduation this year addressing how to, stay, uh, how to stay involved in international issues when you take a job in another field, which is what I think a lot of 
my generation is going to have to deal with, which is learning about issues that are happening in other countries and for the first time uh, really having grown up with the principles of intervention in, in developing countries as to make a difference, but realizing eventually that the international aid system has been flawed for a while and that the economy is bad and not everybody can work abroad. So something that I'm interested in is what my generation's voting habits would be because now we are so interested in foreign policy and what is going on in, in other countries around the world. And we are specifically organizing ourselves to discuss this um, even, as, uh, even as we face issues in our own country that we might not necessarily want to face. So, Marlene, Mike, maybe you could take that question and answer it in a way of making uh, concluding remarks, too. Uh, well, first of all, you're right that that's the kind of uh, civic action that we expect from this generation. There's another group called the Roosevelt Institute Campus Network, which has engaged thousands of millennials in writing a vision of what this country should be in 2040. And when they get to the action part of that vision, it's all what they're going to do in their local community and just the kinds of questions you're asking. So we are, we are enormously encouraged uh, by the generation. We love to talk to the generation, but we mostly spend our time explaining you to the other folks, because it's the other folks who are causing the problem, not you guys. And so we're going to try and see if we can move that dialogue to a more productive place. And just in, in conclusion, uh, one of the things we have found out and we have seen consistently is, in fact, that your generation uh, while certainly it does have very real concerns at home trying to uh, obtain employment, pay off student loans, all of those sorts of, of very important personal issues, the uh, uh, willingness to engage with people around the world is probably, uh, is and definitely unique to this generation more than any other generation. Certainly the new technology helps in that. The ethnic diversity of the generation makes a difference in that. But just also the, the, the general notion of tolerance and concern. The communities that millennials seek will not, will, will, while they may resolve issues at a local level, will have a global reach. I think in the end. A reminder that tonight, for those of you who are interested, the dis debate viewing and the debate discussion, 5 o'clock in the Annenberg East Lobby. Tomorrow night, for those who want to hear a discussion about the Obama uh, uh, jobs speech, that'll be in Tudor Hall every Wednesday for, uh, throughout this year. Same time, same place, 11.30 for a lunch kind of mixer thing, 12 o'clock for an interesting conversation. Please join me first in thanking our terrific web jockey, for those of you who noticed the magic there, Jeff Baum, who puts these things together, and our wonderful uh, guests, who were nice enough to make this the first stop on their world tour, Mike Hayes and Morley Winograd. Thank you. And they will be signing books up there. And thank you all so much for coming. I think it's a complicated thing though because